is Mikko, and I've been, I've been hunting hackers all my life. As mentioned earlier, I work at F-Secure. <coughs> we do uh, security software and consulting services, and my job for the last 28 years with the company has been to understand who we are fighting, understand who are the hackers, where do the attackers come from, who are these people, where do they live, what are the organized crime gangs behind the attacks, what are different governments doing, different intelligence agencies, different militaries, and where are we headed. And obviously the biggest shift that has happened during our lifetime in technology has been the internet, which is pretty obvious. This is the biggest change that has happened. This is the thing that we will be remembered for. Hundreds of years in the future, when people look back at our time, number one thing they will mention in history books is that these were the first people on the internet. We are the first people on the internet. And internet took away geography. The internet has no geography. There are no borders. There are no distances. And that has given us great benefits. Lots of new business has cr been created thanks to the internet. Much more connectivity, much more entertainment. But, of course, it has a downside. Like any technology has a downside. And the downside with the internet is that there is no geography. Before the internet, we only had to worry about local threats. For military purposes, you only had to worry about your next door neighbor, basically. And for crime purposes, you only had to worry about the criminals living in your city. Now, we are already at the verge where it's now getting more likely that you become a victim of a crime in the online world instead of the real world. This still depends a little bit on where you live, but in most civilized, civilized nations, crime rates are low. But when we leave the real world and go to the online world, then we are not in our countries anymore. We are on the internet. And we have to worry about criminals from, I don't know, Vietnam or from Argentina. Criminals who otherwise could never reach us can reach us in the online world. And that creates a big challenge for us Security people, I work in virtual security, software security, cyber security, but it's not that different from real world security, from law enforcement, from military. One similarity is that when we do our jobs right, nothing happens. For example, you never see headlines in newspapers about how the largest company in your country was not hacked yesterday. Like, that's not news. If it does get hacked, well, then it is news. Same thing with defense. People who spend their lives dedicated to defending their nations build all their skills, hoping that they never have to use them. When militaries do their jobs right, they never have to fight. When you have credible defense, you never have to use it. Security works by being invisible. And this is sometimes a little bit problematic, because I do a lot of visits to our customers and clients, doing briefings to leadership teams. And it's typically the, the CFO, the chief financial officer, who goes through their budgets and looks at figures. And then he asks me that, hey, it says here, we spent 50,000 euros last year in your services. Why are we spending all this money with you guys? We have no security problems. <laughs> and then I point out to them that your headquarters are really nice, nice and tidy and clean. You know what? You can fire all your cleaners and janitors. Clearly, you don't need them. So when we do our job right, we are invisible. But when we fail, then it, of course, becomes very, very visible. So let me just give you one example. Seven weeks ago, the second largest company in the country of Norway was hit by an attack run by a Russian organized crime gang, which we call Locker Goga. Locker Goga gang runs ransom Trojan operations, but these ransom Trojans are different from the ransom Trojans we, we know. Ransom Trojans 
which have been going around for the last five years, typically spread randomly and hit random organizations, lock their computers and ask for Bitcoin to get their files back. This is different. This is a gang which does reconnaissance, which picks their targets, which does their homeworks. They look for companies, then they start mapping their network, try to find a way in, and when they get in, they might be spending weeks doing lateral movement within the network of the company until they've reached everything they want to reach, until they've hacked every data center, every server, every backup system, and then they lock all these systems. And then, when everything's been locked and encrypted, they don't ask for bitcoins as a ransom. No, no, no. They just leave their email address. Please get in touch. Let's negotiate. That's what they do. So in this case, seven weeks ago, the second largest company in, in Norway is in the business of making aluminum, Norsk Kudro. And manufacturing of aluminum is especially fragile business. They do this around the world. And on the Tuesday morning after the attack, when employees got to the offices of this company, there were notes on the doors written by IT guys early in the morning telling the employees that do not turn on your computers. Now, if you ever get to your office in the morning and you see this on the door, this is a bad sign. <laughs> and when I say that aluminum manufacturing is fragile, I really do mean that. Aluminum factories, when they've built, then they run 24 hours a day, seven days a week, forever. You never stop them. You can't stop them. If you have to uns do, a, do, an, do a stop on the factory, you typically lose the whole factory. You never stop the manufacturing process. We actually have examples of this going wrong from Venezuela, from February of this year. Venezuela, as many of you know, has had big problems uh, with their society lately, including extended power cuts. And because of these unscheduled extended power cuts earlier this year, Venezuela, the whole country, lost all of their aluminum factories permanently. They are now without any manufacturing capability for at least a year. So this is what we were worried about when the news hit about Norsk Hydro. Because they announced publicly that they had to take all of their computing systems offline, including all the computers that control all their aluminum plants all over the world. And today, every plant, every factory runs on computers. They run on PLCs, small boxes made by manufacturers like Siemens and Honeywell and Schneider. That's what runs our factories. That's what runs our societies. And they had to take them offline. And they didn't lose a single factory. They didn't lose a single plant. How on earth did they succeed in keeping their plants running without the computers? What is the answer? And the answer is, this organization still had enough old farts who were still working at the company, who were able to remember how it was done. Guys like this who still remembered how you used to run factories before computers, who still had binders with calculations and numbers and figures on paper. These guys just owned, just earned their pension, right? So we can still do this. They could still do this. Full credit to the company. They didn't negotiate with the attackers. They paid no ransom. They had backups of their systems. They had enough know-how to keep on operations. But how much longer can we do this? Five years? Ten? Fifteen? We are at the very end of the time of analog operations. And when we look at governmental attacks, we are crossing lines that we've never crossed before. Nuclear physicists lost their innocence in 1945 when we, the mankind, for the first time used the power of the atom as a weapon. Computer scientists lost their innocence nine years ago in 2010 when we, the mankind, for the first time used a cyber attack in an attack which could have killed humans.
I'm referring to the Stuxnet attack, which was violently breaking up nuclear centrifuges in Iran. Two months ago, I think we crossed another line, this time in the Middle East. IDF spokesperson from Israeli Defense Forces tweeted about an attack that they had just launched on the 1st of May, targeting cyber operations run by Hamas. And when I say targeting cyber operations run by Hamas, I'm not referring to attacking with the denial of service attack. I'm talking about missiles. And when you retaliate against a cyber attack by blowing up buildings, I do think we're crossing another line here. Now, many nations have been, res have been reserving the right to retaliate against cyber attacks with kinetic force already years ago. Some of you remember when President Obama made very strong speech about this very topic seven years ago. Reserving the right to respond to cyber attacks with any means necessary, including kinetic. But now we are seeing it happening for the first time for real. And we are crossing another line. And the superpowers are spending more money, more effort and more manpower in cyber than ever before. Not just in defense, but also in offense. And when we look at what's happening with Russia and China, it's quite remarkable how similar and how different these two superpowers are. Both of them are highly active with cyber attack, especially espionage and spying attacks, but also waging real war. But they couldn't be more different from the point of view of the technology they built. Russia is the biggest country on the planet. China has more people on the planet than any other country. Both countries are filled with great minds, great mathematicians, great developers, coders, physicists, great technical universities. But for some reason, Russia is unable to create and export any technology that we would want to use. We don't use any Russian technology. China, on the other hand, is very good in creating and exporting all kinds of technology. We all have Chinese chips in our pockets right now. We don't have Russian chips in our pockets, which of course means that during times of crisis during times of conflict, China has a completely different level, potential level of visibility onto the rest of the world. Russia does not. And the domains where we fight our conflicts, the domains where we fight our wars, keep on expanding. If you look at what's been happening, for example, between Russia and Ukraine, the war has been fought in all the domains we have today. Land war, sea war, air war, space war, cyberspace war. But this is not where the domains end. There will be new domains for, for conflict, new domains for war. What those domains will be, we don't yet know. Is it robotic warfare, DNA warfare, nano warfare? We don't know. What we do know is that it's going to sound like science fiction today, just like cyber war sounded like science fiction 20 years ago, but it is today very real. But cyber weapons are different from all the other existing weapons we have had so far. The power of traditional weapons is mostly in deterrence. You only have to have and show the weapons. You typically don't have to use the weapons. Prime example being nuclear, uh, nuclear warheads. We've only used nuclear weapons two times in mankind's history. The rest of the power of nuclear warheads is in deterrence. It's in having them. Do some nuclear testing to show that you have them and then you know that it's much tougher for anyone to challenge you. We know exactly how many tanks the Russians have. We know exactly how many aircraft carriers the United States has. We know exactly how many fighter jets the French have. We can just go to Wikipedia and look at it. But what is the offensive cyber capability of Italy or Estonia or Vietnam? We don't know. 
There is no deterrence power in cyber weapons because we have no idea what kind of cyber weapons countries have because they don't show them. There's no parades for cyber weapons to show them to other countries to get the deterrence power. And this is problematic because cyber weapons rust, just like any other weapons. They rust. They don't work forever. Cyber weapons are based on exploits targeting existing computing systems, exploiting bugs in the code. And those bugs are eventually fixed, or the systems change and the exploits no longer work. This means cyber weapons have an expiry date. They rot away. So what I'm saying is that militaries and governments are spending millions in developing cyber weapons, which give them no deterrence power, because nobody knows you have them, and they only work for exp a limited time of, uh, amount of time. And this makes it more likely that these kind of weapons un end up being used, if not in war or conflict, then for intelligence gathering purposes. And this is what makes cyber weapons different from any of the other weapons we've had 